Welcome back to the John D. Healy Podcast. I'm filling in for John D. Healy once again. He'll be back on the next episode to interview a person live. But for now, I'm going to introduce the audiobook of And That's How It All Started by Stoney McGurn. This is part six, the last part. So stick around and let's see how this one ends. And before we do get started, remember, as always, these videos are brought to you by Liffy Van Lines. If you need help moving, then let Liffy do the lifting. So now, let's get started on part six of And That's How It All Started. Clans of Kelly's. There were three families named Kelly that I knew on the west side, none of them related. The family of Kelly's was Margaret, the mother, two daughters, Beverly, 22, and Sue, 16, and a son, Larry, 19. Beverly was a strong-minded, straight talker. Whatever she did or said, she had an explanation for it, made no excuses. After she lost her job as a receptionist at Goldman Sachs, even though there was a recession, she found one as a receptionist in a cat house, a house of prostitution, on the Lower East Side. I found it so interesting. People on the West Side talked so openly and matter-of-factly about some situations. Margaret, the mother, and the daughter, Beverly, talked about the 16-year-old Sue, who had gotten into drugs and prostitution. Margaret said, She's underage. I can have her put away for a year or more. Beverly said, don't do that, Mom. Before you know it, she'll be old enough to do what she wants, and she'll only hate you more. She's going to do it anyway, so let me get her in where I'm working. This way I can keep an eye on her. It's called making the best of a bad situation. I was talking to Beverly sometime later about how her job's going. I asked her if she would make more money working like the other girls. She said of course she would. I just don't like to fuck. She married an electric contractor that she met when he was a customer at where she worked. They bought a house out on the island and moved. Larry got himself a good education, got married, and moved to New Jersey. Sue disappeared. Nobody knew where she went. And Margaret stayed in the rent-controlled apartment on the west side. The second family of Kellys was Fred, Tim, Sean, and a sister, Ellen. Fred was the best of them. He worked in the neighborhood for the city and was a member of Union Local 32B. There was a vacant building on 90th Street where a movie company was shooting some scenes for a movie called Midnight Cowboy. Movie companies always put out a big spread of food for the crew on big tables on the sidewalk. One time, Fred was walking by and took a fruit. A guy stopped him and asked if he was working on the movie. When Fred said no, he was told not to take anything off the tables. Okay, said Fred, and he walked away got a sledgehammer, went into a vacant building nearby, and started breaking a cast-iron bathtub. All you could hear is the director yelling, Cut! 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 The big boss found Fred swinging the sledgehammer. We're making a movie! Stop this noise! But Fred could be very aggressive. You got your job, I got mine. I get $200 to break those bathtubs. Today, not tomorrow. The director said, can I give you $200 and please do it tomorrow? Fred replied, I shouldn't do this, but okay, I'll do it. When Fred spotted the guy who had stopped him from taking the fruit, he yelled out to the big boss, Can I have a piece of fruit? You can have anything you want on that table. The doorman in the building of the LaSalle was named Taylor. His 18-year-old son got into a disagreement with Tim Kelly. At 2 o'clock one morning, Tim shot him dead outside the LaSalle and got locked up. At that time, the jails were overcrowded, and he only did 18 months for self-defense. After that, he would come into the bar and use the bathroom, say nothing, and walk out. Sean was the oldest, a full-time junkie. He had gone to school with McRory. I was with McRory one day down at the precinct where he worked when he spotted Sean checking the locks on car doors. He shouted, Sean, what are you doing? Don't you know you're outside a precinct? Sean saw McRory. Aha, uh -huh. Dan, I should have known they were cops' cars. The cheap fucks, there is nothing in them. I went to work one Monday evening and Margaret Kelly was at the end of the bar. She told me that Sean Kelly got it Saturday night on 10th Avenue and 19th Street, a Puerto Rican with a machete. He had it in a leather pouch down his leg inside his pants. 
The first stroke took off Sean's right arm at the shoulder. He didn't stop until he had hacked him good. Fred had to go downtown to ID the body. A little while later, Fred came in wearing a suit. Margaret shouted, Down here, Fred! Give Fred a drink of vodka and orange. She asked Fred, Was it him? Was it? Without flinching, Fred put his hand in his pocket, pulled out a roll of money and nodded to Margaret. Yeah, it was him. Stoney, give them all a round of drinks here. I guess if you live in that type of environment, you set your mind to the fact that it's going to happen one day. Later, Fred got caught taking money for favors. He was subpoenaed to go to court, but he skipped to Canada instead. He came back a few years later. I guess he missed the West Side. Ellen, the sister, went out with a guy named Cooney. He came in very little, but for what reason I don't know, he hated me. He hung out with the guy, Mulahoski, who wasn't a bad guy. He was on a scholarship to Regis High School on the East Side, one of the top schools in the city. One time, his brother and a friend were uptown in Inwood at 200th Street, where the train is elevated, heading downtown to where it goes underground at 174th Street. They had decided to ride on top of the train, but at the entrance to the tunnel, there was only one foot of clearance. Bits of them were found for miles. Maybe that's what had turned him on to heroin. He was trying to get off the heroin, so he joined a methadone program, which left him kind of dozy at times. There was a guy, Frank. He was a limousine driver. He liked to be called Frank the Guinea. I had understood that was an insult to decent Italians, but he said, no, he's a Guinea. Okay. Any night he was in, he never failed to say, Tony, if anybody gives you any problems, you tell me and I'll take care of them. It just so happened he was never there when something did happen. Then there was Paul McMorrow, McRory's friend, who came in one night and said, You have a bat behind the bar? I said, No. In this area, you got to have something. So he went away and came back with a three-foot-long, half-inch pipe with an elbow on the end of it and a big roll of black tape. He tells me to hold the end, and he starts rolling the tape around the elbow and on up the pipe. When he was finished, the pipe looked like it had a lump on the end of it. Now, he said, you put that behind the bar. I guarantee you'll find a use for it. I put it behind the bar, and it stayed there for a long time. There was a Japanese man, his name was Akio, who came in at night for about a month. On his finger, he wore an Irish clatter ring, which is a love ring. Some people used it as an engagement ring. He told me he was married to an Irish girl. He was an instructor in karate and also worked downtown. He was a very quiet man. He got to know Flaherty, and he and I became pretty good friends. Ellen and Cooney sit, and Malahuski stands. Ellen and Cooney. The night it all went down. I had seven customers in the bar, including Frank the Guinea and Akio the Japanese. The corner by the door was empty. In walks Kelly's sister, Ellen, with her boyfriend, Cooney, and Mulahuski. They go to the corner by the door, where Ellen and Cooney sit, and Mulahuski stands. Ellen and Cooney order two gin and tonics, and Mulahuski orders a Coke. As I'm serving them, Cooney pulls a switchblade and sticks it into the bar. He says, I'll pay you by cutting your fucking throat. Well, the bar emptied like a stampede. Frank the Guinea was the first out the door, but Akio walks down the bar, says to Cooney, take the knife out of the bar. Cooney yells, stay out of it, it's none of your fucking business. Akio says, Stoney is my friend, I'm making it my business. Cooney pulls the knife out of the bar and goes for Akio. I'm thinking I must put Mulahuski out for the count. Now's the time for Matt's pipe. So I grab it and jump the bar. He has his back to me, and I hit him down the side of the head with a pipe, and, to my surprise, he starts turning his head towards me. He's saying, Ooh, ooh, too, ooh, ooh, what the fuck was that? I said to myself, You fuck. And man, did I hit him again. I was lucky because I could see out of the corner of my eye that Ellen had stayed in the corner. I turned to Cooney, who had cut Akio, but when I went to go for him, I tripped over Mulahuski and fell on my face and lost the pipe. 
I spun around on my back to see Cooney coming down with the knife. I moved my head just enough that the knife stuck in the floor. Shit, that was close. I get him off me, but my pipe is gone. My mind is thinking of a broom handle in the kitchen, but when I come out with it seconds later, the three of them are gone. Akio is behind the bar with his hand in the sink. I never seen so much blood, trailing from the front of the bar and in between the bar to the sink. I'm scared Akio will pass out from loss of blood. I call the cops and say, LaSalle Bar, Amsterdam Avenue, 90th Street, 1013, which is the code for cop in trouble. Man, oh man, did we get cops in an ambulance fast. Four hours later, I have all the blood cleaned up and the bar is full. Flaherty is sitting at the end of the bar wishing he had been there. I wish it too. There would have been less blood spilled. Akio comes in with his arm in a sling. He had gotten 60 stitches. He asked me where they live. I tell him I don't know. He says I think you do. I had a hard time convincing him that I didn't, but I wish I did because I would love for them to have some Japanese justice. After a few more stick-ups, McRory called me and said, I spoke to Dennis Carey in the Red Blazer on the east side. He is opening Red Blazer 2, another bar and restaurant, and he will be looking for bartenders. You've got to get out of the LaSalle before something bad happens to you. You've had a gun stuck in your face more often than me, and I'm a cop for 18 years. I didn't leave right away, though. There was a bar on Broadway and 89th Street, one block down, called Willoughby's. The bartender was called Fast Eddie. He stayed open late, and I would stop by once in a while. One night, he let me in, and there was a tall, well-dressed man in the corner by himself, and a six-foot, five-inch guy with long, blonde hair in the middle of the bar. Eddie introduced me as the Irish bartender up the block. It was my style to buy a drink for everybody. The big blonde said he was an actor. He worked with Richard Harris and Peter O'Toole. As I tell this story, keep in mind, 42nd Street at Times Square was very sleazy at the time. There was nothing on it but sex shows and peep shows and male and female prostitutes. The blonde was okay in the beginning, but then he got nasty to me and started running down the Irish. The man in the corner was a local West Side Irish listening to all this. He shouted at me, You call yourself an Irishman and you take this shit from that blonde homo? Hey, Eddie, let me out of here. As Eddie opened the door, the Irish guy looked back at Blondie and said, You know where I'm going now? Down to 42nd Street to see one of your movies. I think it's the one where you get fucked in the ass. Blondie couldn't help himself. He had to laugh, and so did the whole bar. It was my 30th birthday. I left Fast Eddie and drove home. Back then, if you smelled of alcohol but were not drunk, the cops would let you go. I got stopped on Queens Plaza by two black cops because the left rear light wasn't working. Now, I had a habit of putting my wallet under my front seat. The night before, McRory had given me a book that had been written about him in the emergency police, which did not do him justice. When he gave me the book, I put it under the front seat, and it pushed my wallet so far back I could not find it. When the two cops pulled me over and asked for my license and registration, I could not find either. All I could find was the book. I tell the cops about the book, but it does not work. The cop in charge was very nasty, and his partner was very quiet, said nothing. They cuffed me and called for another patrol car, and when it came, they put me in the back seat with an old-timer. Then, one of the black cops drives my car to the 108th precinct. When I hear the old-time cop talking to the driver, I hear his Irish accent and say to him, The cuffs are very tight. Can you release them a little? He says, You got yourself into this mess. Just put up with it. When we get to the precinct, he takes me out of the back seat, walks me to a room, and sits me on a chair with the cuffs behind my back. Fifteen minutes go by, but it seems like ages. The cuffs are hurting. Then in they walk, the nasty cop still in control. He holds up my wallet and says, You couldn't find your wallet. Then he sits down and starts writing a ticket. The quiet cop just stands there. He has said nothing since I was pulled over. I ask Nasty if he would take the cuffs off. No, he says. As he is writing, I lean over and ask if I can beat this ticket. He tells me that I can't beat this one. Well, I say, if you don't show up for court two times, then I will beat it. Oh, he says, you know the system. 
I sure do. With all the cop friends I have, why not? He stops writing and puts the pen down. He's still nasty. He says to me, This is all one big joke to you. Well, I say, I was 30 years old today, and if the next 30 goes as fast as the last 30, I am fucked. His quiet partner, with the best black humor, jumps up and down and yells, God damn, that is good! He slaps his hands and laughs his head off. Now I feel I can talk. I say, look, guys, at the bar I work in, three precincts hang out there, the 20th, 24th, and the 26th. As you already know, I have very little on me, but I do have a case of beer in the back of the car, and I come over the bridge every night except on Sunday. I'll take care of business. With that, he takes the cuffs off me and walks me to the car. I went to court twice, but he never showed up, and I beat the ticket. After that, I put a hundred-dollar bill in the glove compartment of the car, and every night for two months I drove slow through Queen's Plaza, hoping to meet them, but I never did. Maybe they got transferred. I called McRory a week or two after, asked him whether Dennis had opened up Red Blazer 2. It was ready to go, and I left the West Side for good. Dennis Carey owned the Red Blazer on 82nd Street and 2nd Avenue. It was always full of people from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. for the early bird special. Then people kept on coming in until 2 a.m., closed at 4 or 5 a.m. I often wonder about New Yorkers, why they would stand outside a bar and restaurant in the winter or summer just to be rushed out after they finished eating if they weren't ordering drinks. Waiters and waitresses were told to move them to the bar if there was room there, or out. We need the table. And across the street, there's a bar restaurant. Same food, same drinks, looks even better. And because they're not busy, nobody will rush you. They want you to stay. It makes the place look good to have extra people. But no, they want to be seen standing outside the red blazer. Dennis opened a second place on 88th Street on 3rd Avenue, seven blocks away. He called it the Red Blazer 2. It was big. He put in a 15-piece jazz band and a big kitchen. He hired cabs to take people off the line at the Red Blazer and bring them for free to the Red Blazer too. To no avail, they preferred to stay on the line. The Red Blazer too did very good business, but there were no lines outside. I got a laugh one Saturday night. A young guy was parking his car outside and he gave a good bump to the car behind him. The guy who was sitting in the car jumped out and wanted money for the bump. The young guy ignored him, walked away into the Red Blazer 2, sat at a table for two, got a menu, and sat reading it. The older man followed him in, saw him at the table with the menu, and, figuring the young guy was going to have dinner, ran out to get the cops. Then the young guy got up, walked out, got into his car, and drove away. Ten minutes later, the old man came back in with two cops. The old man kept saying, He was sitting here at this table! He came over to me. You see a guy sitting at this table? I said, Sir, I'm the bartender. I don't see what goes on at the tables. He showed the bump to the cops, and they told him that since his car didn't have any damage, they couldn't make out an accident report. I felt good. I always have a dislike for people who make a mountain out of a molehill. There were two other bartenders, Nathan and McHugh. They were telling me how many times Dennis had fired them. I asked them why they were still there. They told me that Dennis goes haywire when he's drinking and he fires everybody. But then he realizes he has nobody and hires them all back. But I made a big mistake. I had said, he'll only fire me once. And now I had to stick to my guns. I told myself that I'd never drink with him so he'd never get the chance to fire me. McRory was a good friend of Dennis and he got me the job. When the Irish folk singers called the Wolf Tones were in the country, McRory and all his cop friends went wherever they went. After the Wolf Tones played Carnegie Hall, they all came into the Red Blazer too. There must have been 40 of them. Some cops are cheap. About 20 of them had formed a pool of $5 each. The problem was that about half of them had reneged, but they were getting drinks anyway. $60 on the bar, two or three rounds, and it's gone. There's four cops in the corner, two girls, two guys. One cop, Tommy Crowley, puts up $5 and ordered four scotches, a buck and a quarter each. 
Dennis was drinking. Watch out. He squeezed into the corner and had me stop service to tell me that the cops were complaining that I was taking their money. He said he knew that was wrong, but make them happy. Give them all a drink. I whispered to Dennis, See this guy Tommy with the five dollars? I got his round port already. Let me collect, then I'll give them all a drink. Dennis stayed in the corner, watching Tommy put the five dollars back in his pocket. I said, Okay, Tommy, thank you very much. Five dollars, please. Tommy never saw Dennis. He shouted at me, I had five dollars on the bar! It was right there! You stole it, Stoney! My, my, my. Dennis went ballistic. He attacked Tommy for what he saw him do. He ran to the guys who accused me, told them what he saw Tommy do, ran back to me yelling, Stoney, don't give those fucks nothing! Then yelled more at them. Coming into my place, running down my staff, you cheap bastards! I don't need you assholes as customers! The next night, a police lieutenant from the local precinct, Burkowski, came in. He knew Dennis and talked to him about the previous night's incident. I heard him say none of those guys were his men. Dennis agreed, and he had a drink and left. Burkowski came in a few times after that with a friend, Joe. Joe always did the buying. A month went by. One night, late. Dennis, Joe, and Burkowski come in drunk. Dennis told me he was saying goodbye to a good friend. Lieutenant Burkowski had retired. Burkowski said, Dennis and myself were the best of friends for eight years. One Saturday night, it had been very busy, and Dennis had stayed all night. When I finished, he said, You worked very hard. Have a drink with me. He had already been drinking. We drank for two hours, and he started abusing me. I said, You can do this to Nathan and McHugh, not me. He said, Fuck you. You're fired. Okay, Dennis, I said. Good night. I now had to stick to my word, so I went to Ireland with McRory for six weeks. The All-Ireland Football Final Who's playing in the All-Ireland? First, let me tell you, I don't know anything about sports. I don't follow them at all. For example, football, or as the Americans call it, Irish football, is the national game of Ireland. It's run by the Gaelic Athletic Association, also known as the GAA. Each county has a team, and the championship game, the All-Ireland, is sort of like the Super Bowl in America and is played at Croke Park in Dublin, Ireland's capital. The players do not get paid. They play for the love of the game and the pride of their county. My father would not let me play football. He would say that when the GAA paid for my broken leg, then and only then would I play football. Until then, he needed me in the field. There must have been a lot of fathers like mine in Leitrim, because I have been told that Leitrim has never won the All-Ireland Cup. So I grew up knowing nothing about sports. Years later, I was in Ireland at the time of the All-Ireland Final, and my friend, Derek Warfield, a member of the Wolf Tones, managed to get two tickets for us. He didn't know that I knew nothing about football, and I didn't know that tickets to the final match were so hard to get that they're virtually priceless. So there we were, and everything was going great. Derek was jumping and hollering. Then halftime came. I can't recall what he said to me, but it was then that I asked him who was playing. He jumped out of his seat shouting, What have I done? I got a priceless ticket for a guy who does not know which teams are playing. He ran away with his hands in the air. To make matters worse, it was his home team playing against some other county team. Derek came back for the second half, and now I was hoping for his team to win. And they did, and we all celebrated. After Dennis fired me, McRory and I met up in Ireland with the Wolf Tones, who knew a Polish guy, Polski, who had come to Ireland as a teenager and came to own five restaurants and two travel agencies. A real success story. Some months before we arrived, the Russian soccer team had played in Dublin and lost to Ireland. Now Russia wanted a rematch, but they wanted it in Kiev. Polisky, being a sharp businessman with his two travel agencies, chartered a couple of planes to go to Kiev, with stops in other countries. Derek from the Wolf Tones got tickets for McRory and me. Our first stop was in Warsaw, Poland for one day and one night, and then on to Kiev for three days. 
When we got to the hotel, they had set up a bank desk for us to change our currency into rubles. Everybody lined up to get rubles. McRory asks me, You getting on that line? I tell him, I walk before I stand in line for a bus. If they don't take dollars, I'm not drinking. When we got to the bar, we asked one of the bartenders if they took dollars. Only dollars, one of them said. McRory and I had a great laugh when all those Irish guys finally came in with their rubles and the bartenders gave them a hard time saying, No rubles, just dollars. McRory, Derek, and I were standing outside the hotel on the second night when a Russian with broken English approaches us and asks if we'd like to go to an after-hours bar. Absolutely, says McRory. So he takes us two blocks and turns down a dark alley. McRory says, This don't look good. I think we're walking into an ambush. The Russian is walking ahead of us. We stop and he waves to us. We don't move. He waves again and points to a door. We decide to take a chance and move up to where we can see the door. The Russian knocks on the door, some kind of signal, and a very small hole in the door opens. We can see one eye looking out. Then he opens the door and waves us all in. The place is packed. We can hardly see each other for all the smoke. McRory loves having a good time. These Russians don't speak English, he says. Let's give them all names. He calls to the bartender and says, Hey, you! You Russian bastard! We want four beers! Now! You Russian son of a bitch! Derek is laughing nervously, saying McRory is going to get us all killed. But the Russian who brought us all the drinks thinks it's funny. He orders the drinks, but we pay. And we keep paying. Plus, we give him $20 for bringing us here. We're there for about half an hour when McRory says, Do you all see that big monster of a man in the middle of the bar? He keeps staring at me. Suddenly, the man jumps off his stool, pushes his way to us with his big fists, and says to McRory, American! That's right, American, McRory says. The big Russian says, Second World War! Everybody freezing! American takes off his coat and give it to me! I want to buy you a drink! McRory says, Am I glad that American didn't take your coat? The Irish lost the game. We went to Bern, Switzerland next, where the Irish lost the soccer game to an amateur Swiss team. A couple of things fascinate me about Switzerland. It's an inland country with no access to open oceans, and they have large half-acre swimming pools where everybody is naked. I wasn't even allowed into the pool area with my clothes on. When I went in, I stood in the back by the fence to watch. I see young boys and girls with their parents. I see teenage girls lying on their backs and teenage boys jumping over them as if they weren't there. Grandmothers and grandfathers are sitting in chairs. Then I realized that it must be our religious upbringing that has our minds screwed up. We could learn a lot from the Swiss. After observing it all, I feel us old-timers should leave being nude to the young folks. The next day, a guy named Eamon and I met two girls at the pool, and they asked us if we would like to go skiing. We said we would. They tell us they'll meet us at our hotel at 6 a.m. tomorrow. The next morning, we're in the lobby, and they drive up, Sophia and Lena, in a convertible. When we got in the car, it was 70 degrees. In one hour, they had us on a mountaintop where it was below freezing and there was real snow. What a thrill! From there, we went to Milan, Italy, for two days and then to Holland. There was a European folk festival going on in The Hague, but we stayed at a hotel in Amsterdam. Folk musicians from all over Europe were there. The Wolf Tones and the Dubliners were staying at the same hotel as us. The Dubliners were a popular folk group founded by Luke Kelly and Ronnie Drew. Luke had a big, Afro-type hairdo and a flat face that looked like it had lost lots of fights. Sometimes when he drank, it would break out in pimples. McRory knew him very well. One morning, McRory and I are standing in the hotel lobby when we see Luke. McRory says... Look at the sight of Luke. He looks really down. Let's go talk to him. McRory throws his arm around him and says, Hey, Luke, what's the matter? How bad can things be? Luke says, Ah, Jesus, Dan, don't tell anyone. I was down on the canal last night where all the legal prostitutes are, and the whore wouldn't fuck me. Said I was too ugly. 
Don't tell anyone. McRory starts laughing, gives Luke another big hug and says, What? Are you kidding? I'm going to tell everybody. We flew back to Dublin and then to America. It was a great trip. I was glad Dennis had fired me. When I came back, I thought I'd get a job right away, but I was out of work for months. A bar owner I knew, Pat Looney, hired me for his new place on 37th Street and 3rd Avenue, which he called the Rambling Rose after a song Nat King Cole made famous. I worked days. Lunch was okay. There was a young couple in their early 30s that came in three or four times a week and sat in the corner. I noticed that she would go to the bathroom and on her way back, she would talk to any young guy, a stranger. After 10 or 15 minutes, the boyfriend would leave. After another 10 or 15 minutes, she would leave with her new man. I saw this happen about four times. I'm thinking she's selling herself. I got to know them by name, Kim and Jim. Next door, there was a very good restaurant and bar. It was located on the north side of the street, and to give it a catchy name, they called it Charlie's South. It was known as a gay bar, but everybody went there because of the food. They opened a second place on the south corner of 39th Street on 3rd Avenue and called it Charlie's North. The entrance was on 3rd Avenue, with an exit door out to 39th Street. It was strictly a gay bar, no food. Kim came in on her own one afternoon and used the bathroom, then had a drink. She told me, I always go to Charlie's South with friends for dinner, so I thought Charlie's North was the same. I walked in. It was all men and dark. I was met at the door by a man. Yes, madam, what can I do for you? I told him I just want to use the bathroom. Right this way, madam. He walked me to the back where there's a door with big red letters, ladies' room. Before I knew what was happening, he had the door open and I'm standing on the sidewalk on 39th Street. We had a good laugh. I bought her a drink and asked her if her boyfriend was working. She said he's not her boyfriend, he's her husband. I said he's a pretty cool dude if he doesn't mind you with other men. She said, It's like this. He likes to watch me having sex with other men. Our closet door has a two-way mirror. He stays in the closet and watches. She said that at first she wasn't crazy about it, but then she got into it herself. She said, What is your day off? I told her Monday. She said, Can I meet you here? You and I will have a good time. Let Jim enjoy himself in the closet. Kim, I must be a real clod. I got to pass on this one. It wouldn't be comfortable at all with someone watching in a two-way mirror. Kim, I said, If you like it that much, why not charge money? Two months later, Pat sold the rambling rose to a gay woman and I was looking for another job. I was hoping to buy a bar someday. Some people would tell me that the big money was in gay bars, and I thought about it. Gays don't bother me. Why not? One night, I'm driving up 3rd Avenue. I'm passing the old rambling rose. It's 2 a.m. I decide to go in, and it was full. There was music and a lot of men dancing, hugging, and kissing. One of the bartenders was telling a customer his hair was ravishing. I went to work for a contractor I had met, Aidan Ross, who had opened a new bar at 27th Street on 7th Avenue in the Garment District. At the time, it was 90% Jewish-owned, with minimum wage workers. Not a good neighborhood for an upscale restaurant and bar. Across the street was FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology. There was 1,800 girls and 400 men. Some of the girls would come in, but none of them had any money. I guess everything was paid for by Daddy and Mommy. They would go to the east side where they could meet young guys to buy them drinks. I got to know a girl named Karen from Chicago. She was very outgoing. She'd stay late until I closed and ask me to walk her to the dormitory. She would say, I'd take you up, but we can't have boys in. She asked me where I lived, and I told her flushing. Alone? She asked. Yes, I said. I would see her from time to time with her girlfriends. They would stop in for a drink before they headed east to meet the boys with the money. She comes back from the east side one Saturday night, tells me her girlfriends all met guys, but she came back to me. What a line of BS. She tells me that she told the school she wouldn't be in that night. She says she's going home with me tonight. We have a few drinks, and it's 6.30 a.m. when we get to Flushing. We go in the living room, and Karen takes off her clothes. No bedroom for Karen, so we start making out on the couch. 
Nothing has happened yet. But out of the blue yonder, she jumps up and runs out the door into the street naked. I grab a blanket from the couch and run after her, telling myself I'll be locked up for attempted rape if a cop car drives down, me with a nude girl in the middle of the street. I don't know what I said, but I talked her back into the house with the blanket wrapped around her. I start helping her to get dressed, and when she is almost dressed, she starts making out again. I tell her it's very late and I've got to work tonight. I got to get her home. She seems to have her wits about her at that point, and says that she told them she wouldn't be home. I say, you weren't home. Today is Sunday. I drop her off, and she's kissing and hugging me, saying she'll be in to see me. The following weekend, she comes in with her girlfriends, jumps on the bar step, giving me a hug and a kiss. From there on, I'd buy her a drink, but I was scared of her. The bar owner, Ross, didn't pay his creditors, and everything was auctioned off. I met Mick Carty, who was very successful in the business he owned, Rosie O'Grady's. I said it's very sad about Ross losing everything. Not everything, says Mike. He has a big house in New Jersey, and it's the cat's meow. Now I'm looking for another bar job. I decided to take the subway to Wall Street and started walking uptown, going into every bar. I had no luck until I got to 43rd Street and 8th Avenue, a bar called the Blarney Stone. There were 27 Blarney Stone bars in the city. Dan Flanagan, the owner, had working partners in each one of them. When I went in, it was 3 p.m. and lunch was over. I asked the bartender if the boss was around. He pointed to a guy wearing an apron sitting in the middle of the bar. I introduced myself. I knew the right thing to do, so I put a 20 on the bar, ordered a club soda, and bought him and his friend drinks. I asked if he had any jobs, and he asked where I had worked. I told him for Jack Beckett for eight years. He said that he knew Jack very well and introduced himself, Tommy Stinson. He said, I own this bar. I'll give you a few shifts. If you work out, I know another Blarney Stone. Come in tomorrow night. Thank you very much, I said. As we were talking, a young Irish guy, a student out for the summer, walked in casually and asked him for any shifts. Tommy turned and looked at him and very abruptly told him no. Then the kid asked where there was another Blarney Stone, and Tommy told him to just keep walking. He'd find them. This did not phase the student. He walked away. Now, I remember when I first came to the city, I didn't know north from south, east from west. So I said, Excuse me, when you walk out the door, make a right. You'll find a Blarney Stone on 56th and 8th Avenue. He thanked me and kept going. I said, Tommy, were you not a little rough on the kid? He says, let me tell you, we were raised to be hard-working. Did you not hear what those students are doing the past five years? Well, Tommy, I said, I did hear something. Yes, says Tommy. They have screwed themselves. They won't pay anybody, skip out on rents, run up hundreds of dollars on people's phones, and when you confront them, they're gone. Ireland will have some time in the future with those bastards. I worked for Tommy for one week. Then he got me a job in a Blarney Stone on 6th Avenue at 47th Street. There were two across the street from each other on 46th and 47th Streets. I worked Saturday and Sunday night on 46th Street. Next door was a run-down dump with X-rated movies and peep shows on the ground floor and a whorehouse upstairs. They all came in for food at the steam table and took it with them. A guy came in one night from the dump of a peep show and said he was the manager. I tried to show no surprise, but I'm sure it showed. It was now retired Lieutenant Burkowski. I said, it's hard to live on a pension nowadays. You've got to make ends meet. I'm saying to myself, what a change of pace. The place on the second floor was called Pillow Talk. It was run by a young black guy named Keith. He was big, six foot five inches, in his thirties and good looking. He would tell me he was going to college for a degree in business. I said, Keith, you're getting some on-the-job experience upstairs. He had 15 girls, mostly white. Sometimes two or three of them would come down, get a sandwich, and take it upstairs. One Sunday night, it was January, it was zero degrees, and there was three inches of snow. It's 1 a.m. Keith walks in. Stoney, ten pastrami and five corned beef sandwiches on rye with mustard. As I'm slicing the meat, I'm making conversation. I ask, how's business? Not good. 
says. Well, I say, it's very cold outside and with snow on the ground. He says, that shouldn't stop dicks from getting hard. Well, I say, every business has its drawbacks. I worked with another barman, Frank Dillon from County Clare. We had lots of fun, and fun with the customers. There was one black man named Rufus who used to talk a lot, and when he got a few drinks in him, he would talk about different countries and governments. Frank would joke with him and say, You know everything. He'd say, Frank, I don't know everything, but I know a little bit about everything. I know there is over one billion Chinese in the world, and there is a pig for every one of them. Man, do these people love pork. Frank and I laughed in disbelief. It would amuse you what would come out of his mind. Making a Deal Mike Cardi, my friend from way back, was now the owner of Rosie O'Grady's Bar in Midtown. He called me to tell me one of his chefs, Otis, a German guy from Yorkville, knew of a small building with a bar up in his neighborhood, 85th Street near 1st Avenue, that may be for rent or sale. McRory was still a cop, and he knew nothing about the bar business, but he always talked about us getting a bar together and being partners. I called the owner, a retired New York City detective from County Cork named Dennis Ford. He was buying and selling buildings all over the five boroughs, from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. He was doing better with his retirement than Lieutenant Perkowski in the X-rated peep show working for sleazebags. McRory and I met Ford at the place on Sunday. It looked like it needed a lot of work, but it had a nice crowd of older people. The first thing I noticed was the sewer pipe coming in through the ceiling, through the middle of the floor, and into the basement. The wood was rotten all around the pipe. They had put clay into the hole, and it had gotten hard, so it was leak-proof. There were cats drinking milk out of it. This was something you'd see in the mountains in Leitrim, cats drinking milk out of a hole in the middle of the floor. Ford says, I will rent the bar for key money, $50,000, or I'll sell the building to ye. I'm thinking I can't pay $50,000 and then gut the place. Anyway, what I wanted was a corner building, so that was the end of that. Or was it? I always remember my father saying, Eyes, ears, and feet are worth a million each. Try and hang on to them. Money is secondary, but if you do make money, buy a building. I had loaned some money months back to an Irish guy in Queens, who had gone back home to Ireland because of the death of a family member. A couple of weeks after the meeting, I called him up and asked if he could repay me. I was surprised when he told me to meet him on 61st and Roosevelt Avenue, Woodside, at 5 p.m. today. I took the train to the 61st Street stop. The Irish guy wasn't there, so I decided to walk across the street for coffee. Coming around the corner, a car had to stop for me. I didn't look at the driver, but he shouts at me, It's Ford! What a chance encounter! He says, Get in. So I do. He parks the car and we go for coffee together. He tells me, I'll deal with one guy, and that's you. Then you can do what you want. I'll sell you the building. No more haggling. $200,000. He asked how much cash I could give him. I told him 60000 He said, That'll do me. Here's what you do. Go to the bank or banks. If they don't lend to you, then I'll take on the mortgage. And here's a tip. Don't bring a cop into the bar business. I don't know one that was successful yet. Thanks, I say. McRory, as a cop, can't buy or work in a premises that's licensed to sell liquor. It's New York State law. He said that he'd put in for early retirement. I got an Italian lawyer named Verini. When we met him, he tells us that he's been dealing with Irishmen for 40 years, and a handshake is as good as a written contract. He must have really believed that, because he never held back any escrow money. He did not check to see that there's no taxes owed on the business or the building. We went to the closing, Verini, Ford, and his lawyer. When all the papers were signed but one, Ford tells his lawyer to call the bank and find out the interest rate. Twelve percent. Okay, says Ford. Sign that. I charge the same as the bank, twelve percent. We sign the last paper, then go back to the bar. Ford didn't tell me that he had counted every bottle, every half, and every quarter bottle. I had to pay another $4,500 in cash for the stock. I was still working in the Blarney Stone, 
So I tell Colm Brogan, the night manager, that I bought a place. He asked me, do I want to stay on here for a while? I said yes. Well, he said, Dan Flanagan keeps in touch with the Liquor Dealers Association, and your name will pop up, and you will be history the next day. Go to the boss tomorrow morning. Tell him your brother-in-law is a cop. He bought a bar, but he can't show his name. He's using your name on the license. I did that the very next day, and it worked. I was working there when Bobby Sands in the north of Ireland made worldwide headlines. He was on a hunger strike in Long Cash Jail in Belfast. He was protesting the harsh treatment of prisoners by the Maggie Thatcher administration. He had been elected to the British Parliament and to the Irish government while he was in jail. He was about to die when the Northern Aid and the IRA organized demonstrations outside all English embassies in many countries. They went one step further and contacted every bar in the whole city and asked them to close from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. on a certain day in support of the hunger strike. It was amazing. All of the Italian and Greek restaurants closed in respect, and they hadn't even been asked. A few of Flanagan's partners were IRA sympathizers, like Tommy Stinson, the first guy that hired me. Most of the partners wanted to close, but Dan Flanagan was so cheap he never sat in a cab. Buses and subways were his ways of transport. He said he's not closing 27 places for some guy who wants to starve himself for a cause. His places will stay open. Four days before the bars were to close, I was working on 47th Street with Frank Dillon. His brother had come out from Ireland to visit because his brother Frank is working in a Blarney Stone and brings with him a clipping from the Irish Times newspaper saying that a partner of Dan Flanagan had sold his share of a Blarney Stone on 59th and Madison Avenue, New York City, for one million dollars. Back in Ireland in 1981, you could buy five bars for that. I took the clipping home. The next morning, Flanagan was waiting for me. He was a quiet man. He said, Do you have that clipping, Stoney? I left it at home, Mr. Flanagan. Would you bring it in tomorrow? Yes, sir. When he saw his name in the newspaper, he wanted no screw-ups. He went around personally to all his partners. No misunderstanding. Close all Blarney Stones. I was told later that what scared him most was the thought of being kidnapped for ransom. Frank Dillon's brother made history. Thanks for coming over. I left the Blarney Stone. We decided to gut the place we had bought on East 85th Street, which we had named Ryan's Daughter, after the famous movie starring Robert Mitchum and Sarah Miles. We hired Joe Cardi and Frank Dwyer as contractors. We started on the second floor first. When that was finished, we opened it and closed the first floor. We stayed open through all the renovation. The first floor got new everything, new bar and kitchen. Back in the 1980s, it was a trend for all bars to have a canopy inside over the bar. Joe asked Frankie to build the canopy, but he built it according to his own height. He's five foot one inch. Our first St. Paddy's Day, I hired two six foot tall bartenders. They hit their heads when they walked behind the bar. Frankie Dwyer was one of the smartest guys I met. My father was right. He used to say you measure a man's height from his neck up. I got a call from my brother Jim in Dublin. A friend of his was coming to New York. Could I hire him? I said, tell him to come see me when he gets here. Two days later, a little guy came in, asked for me, told me his name is Henry, and that he's a friend of Jim's. I told him I have three or four weeks of work. I had him helping me most of the time. I said to him, You're from Dublin, but do I detect a slight Northern Ireland accent? He told me yes. How did you meet my brother Jim? He said, When I got out of Long Cash after twelve years for killing two British soldiers, I came to Dublin, knew nobody, met Jim, and he's the only friend I know. Well, I said, I don't think Jim is into the cause. Henry said that Jim never knew until a few months ago when he applied for a Donnelly visa to go to the States. They had mailed him the form, so he had to ask somebody for advice, and Jim was the only one he knew, and he told Henry not to lie on the form. So he hadn't, and it had worked. He got the visa. I said, it worked out for you. I told him I knew a guy who did time in Long Cash, lied on the form, and came to live in Woodside. He was here one week. A knock on the door at 2 a.m. FBI, saying, 
You want to stay in the United States? You join the Northern Aid and IRA and report to us. He said no, no, and no. The FBI gave him a free trip home. I said, Henry, do you mind telling me how you got caught? We were hiding out up in the mountains. The special branch called. The Black Watch got us. They beat us very badly. We were in the hospital for a long time, but we survived. It was their buddies we killed. I used to cook lunch and sit everybody at a big round table in the back. Joe Carty had bought a new walk-in van, and he wanted steel shelves welded into the sides. He knew this welder who worked out of his truck, so he called him and told him he wanted the shelves put in and where he was working, and he gave the guy the address. The next day, Henry and I were working on the wall up front when Joe's welder pulls up outside, gets out of the truck. Henry looks out and says to me, The guy outside by the truck is the Black Watch Special Force Sergeant who beat us half to death. What a coincidence. 3,000 miles away on a side street in New York City and you guys meet. Holy mackerel. Joe Cardi was always up for devilment. When I told him who his welder friend was, he said, Well, we'll have to set them together at lunch. When I told McRory, he was not pleased. Henry said, I did my time, no grudges, I have to get on with my life. When I got them lunch, I made sure they didn't sit together. McRory's parents were from the North, so he was a sympathizer. When everybody was sitting, he came to the table and said to the Black Watch Special Force guy, You wouldn't put a pimple on a cop's ass. All you are is an invader. I wouldn't sit at this table with a fuck like you. Henry, you do what you want. He walked away. Nobody said a word. By the way, Henry and the welder never did speak. Henry decided to go back to Ireland. The English Black Watch guy became a religious freak, always carrying the Bible. The last I heard, they put him in an insane asylum in the Bronx. We needed an accountant, so I called Dennis Carey of the Red Blazer. We had made up and had become good friends. He told me he liked his accountant, Sal Rungan. He asks me nothing, comes in, does the books, and leaves. Dennis, I don't know about that. But we're so busy, if you think he's okay, I'll chance him. Our business was not good, but there was some money coming in. I ask Sal, are we paying our taxes? Yes, he says, everything is fine. McRory wanted to take some money out, but I said we've got to pay the contractors and get this work done and get the kitchen open. We got the kitchen open with a chef, a prep guy, a waitress, and porters. When the meat supplier came in looking for his money, McRory was there and told him there was no money. When I came back later, McRory said, This white elephant is too much for me. So much work and time and nothing to show for it. He says, When it comes to paying those guys, I want you to do it. I don't like paying out money. I like to take in money. Then came the big shock. A lady walked in, saying she was from the IRS. This place hasn't paid taxes in three years. I will be putting a chain on this door in two weeks. I called a friend, Johnny Mann. He also had had a hard time starting off, but now had five bars and restaurants. He told me his accountant, Jeff Bernstein, was the best. He wasn't taking on new clients, but he gave me his number anyway. I called Jeff and told him our big problem. He said because I was a friend of Mann's, he'd come and look at our books. When he saw the books, he said first he'd call the IRS, get a stop on the chain on the door. My fee is $10,000. While we're discussing how to go about dealing with his tax problem, in walks a man saying he's from the IRS. $15,000 back taxes on the building. He says it was $12,000, but with penalties it's now fifteen. After Jeff got everything postponed, he started in on Sal, our first accountant. He looked normal, but he had had a nervous breakdown. With all his clients, for three years he had come in, taken his check, and thrown all the tax papers in the garbage. Jeff was able to talk him into giving us back his salary. We tried to get Ford to pay the $15,000, but to no avail. 
Two more years pass. With penalties, it's now up to $60,000. Our old lawyer, Verini, had had an assistant, Joe Purcelli, who, with a partner named Maloney, had opened his own office. Jeff told me Joe Purcelli was very well liked by the IRS boys. And man, could he negotiate a deal. So I hired Joe. First, he went to the IRS and got the penalties cut in half, to $30,000. Then he went to Ford, explained how it was his $12,000 originally that had risen to sixty. He told him the IRS would drop it to thirty if it got paid by the end of the month. Stoney feels he owes none of it, but to get it over with, he'll split it with you and pay fifteen thousand. It's a deal, says Ford. Joe was worth his ten thousand dollars. McRory said, We got to get out of this white elephant. We'll sell, and you go on your own and buy another place. It's not a problem to you to build another place. I said, I can't. I know where every nut, bolt, hand valve, and shutoff valve is. I can't do it again. Here's my problem, he said. If you stay and make it, I can't take it. My friends will be ribbing me. How you made it and I didn't? I'll buy you out, I say. I'll make you pay, says McRory. He got a good Jewish lawyer who told him to never make eye contact with me again. I got a fool of an Irish-American lawyer. McRory wanted $300,000. I offered him $250,000, but property values were going up. We ended up in court, and at a hearing, we went up in front of a woman judge. She went into a long talk about how if we could come to an agreement today, it would be better for all the parties involved. Not for the lawyers, though. If we didn't come to an agreement, then she would start the proceedings, which could last for months. She said, I want you all to go out into the hallway for 20 minutes and try and solve your differences. We all went out into the hall. I took it upon myself to talk, not looking at McRory because he wouldn't look at me. I said, I have offered you $250,000. You want three hundred. dollars to eliminate months and months of lawyers' fees, I'll give you two eighty. If you're going to fight over twenty thousand, then let's go to court. He told his lawyer he wanted to call his wife. He came back. She had said to do it. We go back in and tell the judge. She's so happy. This is always best for everybody. Now I have no money to pay McRory. I go to my friend Mike Cardi, owner of Rosie O'Grady's, tell him my story. It was him who got me the place through his chef. I say I need $300,000. He said he would introduce me to Bill Burke. He's the king in the Bank of Ireland on 5th Avenue and 51st Street. He says, if he doesn't give it to you, then I will. Ever since, when he and I meet, we never talk about it, but I never forgot him for saying that. I went to Bill Burke's office and explained to him how we had signed the papers, but our names were still on the deed. He said, That's all bullshit. Where is the building? 85th and 1st Avenue. He said, I'm going to look at it, and you call me in the morning. Okay, Bill. When I call him the next morning, Bill says, You got the $300,000. Who's your lawyer? Joe Purcelli. Bill says, I hate lawyers. I'll call him and make all the arrangements to have everybody come to my office. Those guys can't run things when they're in my office. A few days go by. We all meet in Burke's office. McRory must have decided to do what his lawyer told him. No eye contact. He didn't come. Purcelli arrives with a trainee lawyer. He keeps telling the kid, Ignore everything you see here today. Stoney legally doesn't own the building. Burke says, The papers were signed in front of lawyers. He'll legally own it in 20 minutes. Then he gives me a look and says, what did I tell you about fucking lawyers? Burke told me to meet him in his office the next morning for my money. Back then, interest rates were 18%, and the news on TV and the papers was that they were going to go to 24%. Everybody was scared, including me. I asked Burke to lock in the interest. He says, Stoney, is there a bank in New York that would lend you money? I say, no. There you have it. I ain't locking it in because it's going to 24%. I understand, 
I said. McRory got his check. I got rid of the kitchen, put in a basketball machine, and made a few more changes. I don't know why myself, but the place took off. I had five bartenders on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. The interest rate on the bank loan fell to 14%, then 12, then 10, then 7, then 5.5. My last year, I was paying 2.5%. Was I lucky Burke refused to lock it in? The Germans have arrived. We had no day business. A young neighbor, Neil, came to me. He said, I know a German woman. Her name is Ruth. She's looking for a job. I said, You tell her there's no day business and she will make no money. He says, Hire her. She'll bring her own business. I ask him, If she's that good, why did she lose her job? He tells me that the owner of the Heidelberg restaurant is a woman who doesn't like the way her daughter is running the place. She has a son living in Germany who she asked to come to New York and run the place. He was very old-fashioned and strict, and the first thing he did was to fire Ruth, and it had upset a lot of the regulars. He said, she needs the job. I said, have her talk to me. I never met a German without self-confidence. But this little older lady came in very nervous, introduced herself as Ruth. I asked her, You think you can make it worth your while? Oh, yes, she said. Can I work for you? It's all yours, I said. When do you want to start? Monday, she said. I need to tell all my friends. I'll come in Thursday and get familiar with the place. She arrives at 10 a.m. Monday. Typical German, very efficient. She got the bar set up the way she wanted it. Germans started coming in by 2 p.m., and by 6 p.m., there were 60 Germans in the place. I could not believe it. They had come in from Ridgewood, Maspeth, Long Island, and New Jersey to show support for her. Come 11 p.m., the ones who had to travel started leaving to go home. They started shaking hands, saying goodbye as if they hadn't had a drink. And there were many empty bottles of Jägermeister and Asbach German brandy and Beck's beer. It was then I realized that the Irish have the name for drinking, but that's just it, the name. In Ryan's Daughter, we have glass doors up front that open up. If we had 60 Irish guys drinking from 2 p.m. to 11 p.m., there would have been a fight, and when they were leaving, it would be through the glass windows, not the door. Yes, sirree, the Germans can drink. We Irish can't drink. Well, some of us can. In the next few years, I got to know a lot of Germans' names, like Adolf, Fritz, Jürgen, Vladimir, Klaus, Karl, Peter, Louis. I want to talk about them. Big Joe was from Bavaria. He had a great sense of humor. They had an Italian friend, Alfio. He used to kid them, and they used to kid him. One night, Alfio was talking about the Second World War and something the Italians did. Big Joe says, Alfio! Do you want me to show you an Italian in the Second World War? Yes, Joe, show me, says Alfio. So Joe jumps off a chair, turns his back to us, puts his hands up on the wall as high as he can, and says, This is an Italian in the Second World War. There was a big German who everybody called Berliner Karl. He was born in West Virginia, but his mother and father went back to Germany when he was three years old. When the war started, he fought for the Germans. Meanwhile, Big Joe, Jürgen, and Fritz had come to America in their teens and were drafted into the American army. They fought against their own Germans. One evening, Berliner Karl was talking about the war and how he saw it. Big Joe said, But Karl, you must understand, we were on the winning side. I found that quite interesting, to hear a German-born tell an American-born that he was on the winning side. I also found it interesting that, back then, if you arrived in the United States and you were under 25 years old, you had to sign up for the draft. Orloff, Fritz, and Vladimir were all drafted. Vladimir was in the German army at 15. He came home to his village once in a German uniform. The war ended, he came to America and got drafted. Now he was in the American army. And what do you know? He got stationed in Germany. When he got to leave, he went to his village in his American army uniform, and some of his neighbors said, 
You left here wearing the German uniform, and now you are back wearing the American uniform? You turncoat bastard! Berliner Karl lived a few blocks away from Ryan's daughter. He worked four blocks away, in a Gristidi's supermarket. He was the dairy manager there for 25 years. He told me they brought in all young guys in their 30s with foul mouths and fired everybody they could who only had three or four years left before collecting social security and a pension. Carl never used a curse word, and because of their foul mouths, he called them the ugly Americans. He called his union, explaining that they wanted to beat him out of his pension. He only had three years left. To make it hard for him, they transferred him to a store in Brooklyn. It was rough on a 62-year-old who was overweight and hadn't ridden a bus or subway in 25 years. But he beat them and got his full social security and pension. He told me he had no problem coming to the United States. He was born here, but because he was raised in Germany, he had to learn English. He said he was lucky that he was captured by the Americans and not the Russians. He was also lucky that the job he got was to cook for all the Allies. His job was an assistant chef. The head chef was an Irish guy who wouldn't teach him English, so he tried to teach himself. The Allies came in three separate shifts. First, the French would drive up in jeeps. The Irish chef would say, Here comes the frogs. And Carl would write down, Here comes the frogs. Then the Russians would drive up. He would say, Here comes the bears. Carl would write that down, Here comes the bears. Then the British would drive up. He would say, here comes the cocksuckers. Carl would write that down. Here comes the cocksuckers. After a few months when it was all over, everybody went their own way. He got the go-ahead to come to America. He wrote to his uncle in the Bronx, telling him when he's arriving at JFK Airport. He picked me up. He's telling me he has two German couples over to meet me to have dinner and celebrate me surviving the war. We get to the Bronx. They were all sitting around the table having dinner, speaking German. A woman asked me what I was doing as a prisoner and did I learn any English. I tell them I was cooking for the frogs, the bears, and the cocksuckers. That's when my uncle grabbed me and took me into the kitchen and tells me if I talk like that again in his house, I'll be looking for a new place to live. After everybody calmed down, they could all see in my eyes and face that I was innocent about what I said. The other staff that worked in the bar while Ruth worked a days were Wendy, from Dublin, in her early 20s back then, with a punk hairstyle, and John Healy, from County Mayo, who had curly black hair. Wendy and John got on great, and both were great with customers. They became the best of friends. After a number of years, John went back to Ireland to open a bar with his sister, with help from his brother and mother. He went on to open other successful restaurants and bars, including a well-known one called Mother Hubbard's in County Kildare, which he designed and built himself. He was the first one in Ireland to provide wheelchair access and toilets for the disabled, before it was a planning requirement, and he went on to campaign for all new buildings to do the same. The campaign was successful, and today it is a building requirement in Ireland. Wendy went to California, had two beautiful children, and lived and worked there for a number of years. Some 35 years after Wendy and John bartended in Ryan's daughter, John returns, and, lo and behold, so does Wendy. John helped her get an apartment and a job, and they rekindled their friendship. Funny where life takes people, and sometimes takes them back. John was in New York when he was six years old, with lots of travel in between, his wish was always to return later in life. Life is like a roller coaster. When I was 23 years old, I met a girl named Bridget in Rockaway Beach. She was also 23 years old, and we hit it off well. We had lots of laughs and fun for a week, but I was truck driving then and soon was off to California and gone on the road for three months. When I got back, I called her, and to my surprise, she was pleased to hear from me. For the next three weeks, we saw each other every night. Then I was away again. Every time I was back in town, I would call and Bridget would see me. This went on for two years. Then she met a guy who was nuts about her. On one occasion, I was back in town and we were in bed when her phone rings. She answers it. Okay, she says, and hangs up. She then jumps out of the bed, grabs my clothes, and shouts, Out! 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 Her boyfriend's on the corner. 
She opens the door and shoves my clothes into my arms. Outside, naked, I jump a fence and get dressed in someone's backyard. Phew! Next time I was in town, I called her again, and she said to come over. I asked her if she had the same boyfriend. Yes, and he wants to marry me. She had been a one-man woman, but now she had two. We were sitting on her couch chatting about the future and our plans. I tell her that I'm young and I want to travel and see all of America. Maybe I'll settle down in ten years. She says, I love him, but I love you more. I tell her that I'm in the same boat as her as I was seeing a girl in the Bronx, Jenny Mulligan, and I am crazy about her and she is crazy about me. I told her Jenny is 26 and she wants to marry me, and I told her the same thing, that I am too young and I want to travel. Just then the doorbell rings. Here we go again. She grabs me and puts me in the closet. Is it him? Now I'm in the closet and I can hear talking, but I can't hear what they are saying. My God, what if he stays over? In the closet it felt like an hour had gone by. My feet are getting tired. With my back against the wall, I lower myself down on my honkers, and the wall at the back of me gives way, and I tumble down what seems like three steps. I lay there, waiting and waiting. Nobody comes. Now I feel safe. It's dark, and I fall asleep. I wake up with Bridget's voice saying, Where are you? She did not know there was a space behind the closet wall, which was a door to a boiler room. I asked, What's the story? She said it wasn't the boyfriend, but a friend of her brother's selling insurance, and she had to do the whole Irish thing and make him tea and cookies and then chat. Then he got the insurance business. I said to her, We got to stop meeting like this. We kissed, and she said it was hard to say goodbye. Give me a call sometime for old time's sake. A year later, I met her sister, who knew about us. She told me that Bridget was married, and she missed me, that I should give her a call. It was a bad move. I was still in town waiting for a full load to go to Dallas, Texas, so I called her. She was all excited. Her husband was away hunting for four days. She invited me out for dinner and I went. She had a beautiful setup for dinner with wine and candles, etc. It was getting late and as we were talking away, I was getting this feeling her husband may come back. I told her I was leaving, but she said, no, he won't be back. I kissed her goodnight and went to my car and looked back at her sad face. I threw her phone number away, and that was that. Or was it? I had also kept in contact with some of Jenny's friends. They told me she had met an Italian guy when they both were going for the same parking spot. It was love at first sight, and they were married within a month. When I was in my twenties, I thought I do not want to bring kids into this world. Some women can be selfish and want to have a baby with no means to provide for it. A baby needs to be fed and loved and educated. At that time, a girl told me she was pregnant. It turned out to be a false alarm. A month later, I make an appointment with a clinic on 1st Avenue, 26th Street, Manhattan, to have a vasectomy. Snip, snip. The procedure was a couple of hours and not all that expensive. My plan was, if I ever get married, the woman better already have kids and that was a slim chance at the time. Thoughts on Life Ruth got old and quit the bar job. Then I got Rosie, a Hungarian who had worked in the neighborhood since she came to the country. She had worked in bakery shops and meat shops, etc., but never in a bar, but she knew everybody in the area. She was so efficient, you would think she had been bartending all her life. Her husband had worked here when it was the old stream years back. She always said he would turn over in his grave if he could see her behind the bar. My life is very good, and as my father used to say, I still got the three million I was born with, eyes, ears, and feet. You lose one of them and you're down a million. It doesn't matter what business you go into, you're going to have your ups and downs. When I gave up trucking and became a bartender, I met a lot of Irish-American police who were members of the Police Emerald Society Pipe Band. One group of them had a trip to Ireland to play at big conventions for the Irish government. I joined them for a trip and they played in the Doyle Aaron at Dublin City Hall. It was there I met a woman named Muriel, who was 36 years old. I went out with her a few times while I was there. The following year, Muriel and three friends came to New York for a trip. We met again, but
but in the meantime, she had met a guy from Baltimore. I told her, You're on vacation for two weeks. Enjoy yourself and have fun. Go out with anybody that gives you a laugh. But try to squeeze me in for a night or two. And she did. When the two weeks were up, I drove them to the airport. The next year, the pipe band went to Ireland again, and I went with them. They had to play at a wedding for a member of the Wolf Tones. The press gave it big coverage. I called Muriel, and she told me that she had seen pictures of us in the newspapers and on the TV. I met and took her to dinner. She told me she had separated from her husband five years ago and had five kids, the oldest 18, and the two youngest still in boarding school. Later, I met them all. She told me her husband lived in Howth, County Dublin. He would not give her a divorce, but he did take care of the kids. She asked him for nothing. She had a job in a hair salon, rented a small room, and visited the kids four times a week. I never seen a room so empty in my life. It had a two-foot fridge with a small carton of milk in it and some cheese. Years later, when I asked why the fridge was so empty, she said, I like to keep slim. She would never say she had no money. The next year, the guys in the band invited three of her friends to New York, and she joined them for two weeks. This time, she stayed with me. When I would come to work to bartend, she would stop in later to pass the time. One evening, I told her she should go see a movie in the area. I sent Rafferty with her so she would not be on her own. I had to wake him up first. Recall he had the sleeping problem. While they were in the theater, he fell asleep and started to snore. People were yelling at him to shut up, so she moved a few seats away from him, and when the movie was over, she left him and came back to the bar. She went back to Ireland, and shortly after, she wrote to me to say that three of her kids were now working and living on their own, and the other two were in private school. They were all raised now. I was in my sister's house one evening after getting that letter, and I told Vera my feelings for Muriel. She said, Call her now, and tell her your true feelings for her. Is it love? I called her and asked her to come to New York. She was worried that she wouldn't get a job, but I convinced her that would all be okay. A few days went by. She called me and said, Yes, why not? Was it love? When she arrived in New York, it was a good time as the bar and restaurant had just opened. Vera was working three nights, and there were also some part-time waitresses. Muriel was new to all of this, and Vera showed her the ropes. She was a fast learner and eager to make the place a success. On quiet nights, Muriel would work on her own, and on Friday and Saturday nights, she worked with Vera. One customer, Ted Poster, was a regular who was helpful and familiar to all of us as he was in the supply business to bars and restaurants. Sometimes he would leave his tab and tip to be paid the following night. One Thursday night, Muriel was working on her own. Ted came in for dinner and left his tab to be paid the next night. He came back in on Friday night and paid Muriel for his previous tab, plus tip, and as Muriel was putting the tip in her pocket, she saw Vera glancing at her. She told me the next day, I think Vera thought I should have put it in the tip jar from the look she gave me. I'm sorry now I didn't put it in. Muriel was so honest and innocent that she did not know she should have explained it to Vera. The restaurant part was not working out, so I changed the dining room, putting in a pool table and some other game machines. After that, it got so busy I had to have Vera, her husband Gabe, and her two sons work three nights a week. At the time, Gabe was retired from the Long Island Railroad, where he was a supervisor at Penn Station. He liked to tell everybody he was a professional at his job. At Ryan's daughter, his job was to check customers' IDs at the door. At the end of the night, after the customers had left, it was usual for the staff to sit at the bar and have a few drinks and chat. Muriel would say they are my great friends. Gabe was a very conservative Catholic with strong beliefs. One Halloween night, we had a fancy dress party, and Muriel dressed up as a little girl in a pink dress, pigtails, pink bows, and pink socks. I said to Gabe, What do you think of the little girl? It seemed he did not approve. Not for my wife, said. That may have changed his thinking of Muriel, but she didn't notice. Business was still good. Another nephew, Colm, came from Ireland and asked to work just weekends. Now, the busy time was from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m., but on the really busy nights, five bartenders would be inside the bar at 9 p.m. One night at 9 p.m., 
Colm decided to go outside to have a quick smoke and say hello to Gabe. Colm lights up, says, Quiet night so far. Gabe, who had a very loud voice, yells, Get back behind your post! Colm was a quiet guy. He just finished his cigarette and went back behind the bar. On another night, Gabe had some incident with a group of customers coming in. He called the day after the incident, and he was yelling so loud I could almost hear him without the phone. He said, I had a problem on the door last night, but I solved it, and I don't want to hear another word about it. Then he hung up. That evening, the bar staff had their view on the incident and said Gabe was wrong in how he dealt with it. As a good friend of mine often says, there are three sides to every story. When Gabe arrived in at 9 p.m., I said, Gabe, I could not hear clearly on the phone today. He said, I told you I did not want to hear another word about it. That's it. I'm out of here. And off he went down the street. He had quit. At the time, the pay to work the door for one night was $100. He had left me with no one to work the door that night. The sons also quit. I could not believe it. St. Patrick's Day was coming up and door staff were needed. I called Vera and asked if her sons could do the door for St. Patrick's Day. She told me she'd have them call me. Anthony called me. Uncle Stoney, I am very busy, but I will work it for 400 I said, Thank you very much, Anthony. I'll get someone else. If he had said 300 I would have gladly paid it. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. A few weeks later, I came home one evening to find Muriel looking very sad. I asked her what was up. She said, I called Vera and Gabe answered the phone. He was very cold to me and hung up on me. I never did anything to wrong them. It was you they had the difference of opinion with. As time went on, she would bring it up, but I would tell her not to let it worry her. A few years went by and Muriel and I took a trip to Dublin. We planned a night at a nice restaurant and invited friends and family of Muriel's, a group of over 40. It was a great night. Her husband, who would not give her a divorce, had met a woman in the Philippines and wanted to get married. So he wrote a letter to Muriel requesting a divorce, and she told him just to send on the papers and she would sign them. Muriel made no fuss, and he got his new wife with an extended family. Soon after, when Muriel's daughters wanted to move to New York... We decided to get married so their immigration process would be easier for them. Two of them, Helen and Sarah, went to New Jersey. Helen married there. Sarah didn't want to get married, but she did want to have a baby. On one of her visits to us, Muriel asked her who was going to take care of it if she had a baby. Without hesitation, Sarah stood in the middle of the floor, placed her hands on her hips, looked Muriel straight in the eye and said loud and clear, You are! That's what grandmothers do! Muriel told her, You are making a choice to have a baby without a father, and I am not going to be an American grandmother. You can come and visit on weekends when the kid gets older and I can take the kid to the park or a movie or a restaurant, but you better make other plans because I am not raising your kid. A year later, Sarah had a baby girl. She would come and visit and then go home. Two years after that, she lost her job and would come looking for money. This I did not know until we found out that Sarah was sending out emails to everybody and anybody saying that she could be sitting outside Ryan's daughter, homeless, barefoot, and hungry, and we would just let her die there. So Muriel set up a meeting of all her daughters and explained that, Stoney pays me a salary and I will give you girls all I can, but I'm not asking him to support you. She really impressed me. In the end, Sarah moved to North Carolina, where she met a guy whose wife had died and left him with a baby girl the same age as Sarah's. When they got married, she did not invite her sisters to the wedding. In 2004, Muriel was diagnosed with breast cancer. The doctor told her she had five years, and she should have accepted that, but another doctor told her to go for chemo treatment. She lost all her hair and got a wig, and then, two years later, she got stomach problems, heart problems, liver problems. As much as she hated it, she needed a cane to walk. Five years later, and she's in Lenox Hill Hospital. Helen and myself stay with her because she can't move as she lays on her back. One evening, I step out to get coffee and use the men's room. 
When I returned, she had vomited on herself. There was a lady with a hospital uniform shouting at her to use the basin if you're going to vomit. Why is she yelling at me? Does she not know I can't move and the basin was three feet away? Muriel says in a whisper as her voice is gone. I say to the lady, give me fresh linens, I'll clean her up. To my surprise, she walked me to the hallway, opened a closet full of linen and said, there. After I had cleaned Muriel up, the nurse walked back in. When I asked where to put the dirty linen, she pointed to a garbage bin. No wonder the prices are high in hospitals. The next day, I called Helen and we took Muriel home for good. It was difficult, but we knew the care was much better. Even in pain, she would whisper something funny, but I found it difficult to laugh knowing she was in pain. I installed a large shower unit with a seat, so when we got in, she could sit while I washed her. One night, I got her all soaped up. I was holding her hands up as I washed under her arms, and she said, Stony. I answered, Yes, Mew, what is it? She looked me in the eyes and said, Are you getting turned on? She was still trying to make some fun of a bad situation. The last few months, she kept wanting to walk. She used to tire Helen and myself out helping her walk back and forth the length of the room. One night, she had me worn out. I said, Please, sit on the couch. And she did. I said, Let me make tea. And as I was making the tea, she said, Stony, why did Gabe and Vera stop talking to me? I ignored what she said. I said, let me help you to the table. I got her to the table and sat down on the other side. A minute later, her head fell forward and hit the table. I jumped up. I realized it was a stroke. I dragged the back of the chair to the couch and lifted her onto it. Then I called the bartender, who was downstairs, to come help me lift her to the bed. I stayed in the bed with her all night. The next day, Helen was with me to help. After four hours, she noticed Muriel was able to communicate with her eyes. She would blink once or twice in response to different things she asked her. That went on for four days. We took turns staying by the bed. Then Helen said, Come, I think she's leaving us. I knew what to do. I recalled Pat Gwicken dying when I was a kid and what Willie Odie did. I got a book put it under her chin to keep her mouth closed. Then I got two one-dollar coins, old ones from 1890. I closed her eyes and put one on each eye. One hour later, it was okay to take them away. She got her wish, do not revive me, cremate me, and scatter my ashes on Park Avenue. Keep half in an urn if you wish. And I did. It's several years since she passed, and I think of her every day. Some would tell me I should find a partner. I tell them I would look silly going out with a younger woman. Lo and behold, a call came to the bar one day. The barman told me it was a woman looking for me. He had the number. He said he could not hear the name clearly. Maybe Bridget? Says she knew you from years ago. I wonder who this Bridget could be. I thought of my father saying he took a chance on Dr. Chance. So, here goes. I dial the number. A woman's voice. I say, This is Stony. How can I help you? I hear a loud, laughing voice. This is Bridget. Oh, man. After 50 years. Yes, yes. I ask her how her husband is doing. He died five years ago. Wow, my wife died several years ago. Coincidence. I am still excited and surprised. Why the call? My brother is organizing a big dance. He asked me to make lots of calls to get a big crowd to attend. I recall you like to dance. It will be at the Waldorf Hotel. A lot of hot shots will be there. Will you come? I said yes. After 50 years, I have to see what you look like. I went that night to the Waldorf. Lots of familiar faces from way back, and Bridget and I spotted each other right away, which was nice. The night was enjoyable. Bridget was with a bunch of friends. We said goodnight and that we would keep in touch. 
The next day, she phoned, and we chatted about the dance, the people there, and how they looked, and how they had progressed in life over the many years that had passed. She said, Will we meet again? Sure, I said. How about next Saturday? I will go to your house. She said, I got a lot of cats. I said, Surprise, I am allergic to cats and dogs. Don't worry, she said. We can go somewhere. I drive out on Saturday. She had everything arranged. We went to a hotel for dinner, and after dinner she had a room booked, all paid for. I felt strange about her paying. Funny. We laughed. I always liked to pay my way. I felt like a gigolo. Since then, we have gone on short trips, gone for drives, dinners, museums, had lots of laughs, and enjoy each other's company. Just like in the old song, When You and I Were Young, Maggie. You never know where life takes you. And that's how it all started.